Hello and welcome everybody, once again, to a brand new episode of r slash malicious compliance. My name is Ryan, the official host here on Reddit Voice, and I look forward to bringing you guys today's top stories. Before I do, however, I'd really appreciate it if you could hit that subscribe button, as well as make sure you got notifications turned on, that way you could stay up to date with all the latest and the greatest here on the channel. Our first story is called, I Just Have to See an ID. You don't have to convince me you're telling the truth. I used to install cable and internet for the local cable company. This company has the same name as a college football team in Ohio with red as their school color. This is my last job for the day and it's only a modem swap. I swap out their outdated modem for a new one, copy and paste their Wi-Fi name and password onto the new one, and that's it. The house is massive and in a really nice neighborhood. I get to the door, ring the bell, and the customer's son is there. Dude looks so young, I ask to see an ID to make sure he's 18 or older. It's a company policy, and 90% of the time I don't ask if the customer looks old enough. The son gets argumentative right away and starts telling me how he's in college. He's actually 21, and how he even has his CCW. I tell him it's the policy, and that he just looks young and I'm only covering my butt. This isn't good enough, and he says hold on and calls his mom, who's the actual account holder, and on her way home. I see where he gets his attitude from when he puts his mom on speakerphone and she tells me how she knows the owner of the company, she's only five minutes away, and that I'll be sorry if I leave before she gets there. She tells me that she made the appointment and made sure someone would be there, and that I should just do my job if I like having one. I just say, okay, I'll get started. I head into the basement and notice that their existing modem also does phone. Their work order, on the other hand, says to replace it only with an internet modem. So most people that still have a landline for phone only do so for their home security system. And when I remove the phone modem and put in a non-phone modem, you no longer have said security system. By the time the mom gets home, I'm all finished and the son is already connected to the Wi-Fi. I apologize, have her sign the work order and quickly drive off. Maybe 10 minutes later, dispatch calls me and tells me how the customer has a security system and that they were supposed to get a phone modem and would I go back. Apparently, the customer's security system was blaring and wouldn't shut off. I explained the situation and how the work order didn't say anything about a phone modem. She understands and says she'll have another tech head over there when someone's free. I gave the tech a heads up and he didn't get over there until late evening. Never heard anything else about it. And I never did anything wrong. You want me to be, uh... This happened several years ago, but the guy, who we'll call Mick, and I were talking about old times and thought I'd share this. This event occurred at an establishment near a US military base. We were at a bar, it was just four of us. A black gentleman, who shall be known as Taylor. Myself, call me Luther, my friend Mick, and a racist. Let's go with Bubba. We're sharing song requests, and old Bubba decides to just start singing the N-word. But it's not even like he was saying the N-word along with the lyrics. He was just bobbing his head back and forth, going N-word that, N-word this, N-word you, N-word everything, blah blah blah. Obviously, this was uncalled for, and he was told to hush. Now Mick and I are both white, but Mick has a biracial son and daughter, and just recently his son was bullied for being black at school. So, racism was a touchy subject for Mick. Taylor also jumped into the conversation, basically trying to explain to Bubba that this just ain't cool. I pull Bubba aside, I recognize it's the liquor talking, and we have a conversation on why the n-word is not okay, especially in a taunting manner like he's using and how he should apologize by everyone around, and we keep it moving. Apparently, Bubba took this to mean we were violating his First Amendment rights. This enraged him even more, and he went on about a speech how if a black man can say the n-word, so should he, and how this is America, we should all be equal, etc. Mick got in his face, and it was getting super heated. I don't think Bubba understood how much he was pissing Mick off. I pulled Bubba aside and basically said he's touching a hot button because his biracial son was recently bullied for being black. At which point, Bubba decided it would be an excellent idea to tell Mick he's a dirty race mixer and a traitor to his own kind. At this point, Taylor and I had zero interest in stopping what came next. Before I move forward, Bubba's an overweight man in his 50s whose hobbies include drinking beer and eating steak. 
Mick was an active duty soldier whose hobbies included weightlifting and boxing. At no point was anyone in that establishment under the misguided belief that this fight would be even remotely close. However, at least in my mind, I knew it would be a short fight. Honestly, calling this a fight would be dishonest. Mick walked over to Bubba and said, I'm only gonna say this once. Apologize and leave. To which Bubba stood up proudly and said, Fuck you! I don't think Bubba saw the punch coming, but he sure did feel it. Bubba went straight down like a dog. He was dazed, and I'm sitting there wondering, am I gonna watch a man get murdered or assaulted just as I sip on my beer? Mick said some words, went to the bar, paid his tab, and left. Taylor paid his tab and left too. Bubba was still on the floor, he was awake, and there I think he was kinda shocked. I walk over to Bubba, ask him if he's okay, and he asks if I can help him up, so I told him he got himself on the floor and he can find a way off it. Bubba gets up, comes to the bar, and Bubba goes, I'm gonna report Mick to his command. I advise Bubba should think long and hard before reporting Mick to his command because it may not end up like he expects it to. Did I mention Bubba was a contractor on the local military base? He was a mechanic that worked on heavy equipment, a very replaceable position. Bubba asks me if I'd be his witness if he decided to report the incident. I told Bubba I'd be a witness and I'd tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and I meant it. This is the malicious compliance part. A few days after the incident, I was also a contractor at the base. I get a call from the MPs asking me if I'm willing to make a statement on what happened, and I said I would. I went down to the Provost Marshal office, and I made my statement and mentioned everything that I mentioned in the post. Afterwards, I called Mick and asked him what was going on on his end. He said that Bubba had reported it and he's being investigated for assault. I asked Mick what he told the MPs. He said he told them the truth, that he punched the guy for being racist, insulting his family and his son. He also said he reported it to his commander. Yes, Mick reported the fact that he punched Bubba to his commander. Mick also said that Taylor made similar statements. I then get called in again, but this time to the base commander's office. As I'm waiting for my time, Taylor walks out, and I ask Taylor what he said. Taylor said everything. I nodded, and it was like we were in this together. I sit down with the commander, who's going over my statement, and I really drove home the fact that Bubba was being racist. He was using racial slurs unapologetically despite being asked to be stopped, insulted Mick's family and called him a race traitor. Actually, very little was actually said about Mick punching Bubba. The commander asked me if I had anything else to add, and I said, I'm impressed he only got punched once. A few days later, I'm talking to Mick, and he tells me he had ended up getting an Article 15 with very light punishment, no reduction in pay or rank. The message he got was take the Article 15, move forward, and you'll be fine. Bubba, on the other hand, Bubba got barred from the base, and as a result, the company he was working for fired him with cause since he couldn't get access to the base. This would mean no unemployment benefits for Bubba. TLDR, racist gets punched, reports it, gets fired, and loses his job. If you can't do it perfect, then don't do it! Okay. I've sat on this story for a while now and figured I'd share it. Backstory. I worked retail when I was younger. Like most people, it was a mixed bag and some of my best and worst memories involve my time working in retail chains. I worked in footwear and then in a blossoming sporting goods franchise and had a real knack for it. It was rewarding helping people find shoes in their size and heartwarming at times, especially when people with disabilities showed up and really needed hands-on assistance with things that were a core value the company had at the time. My hiring supervisor, whose name isn't important, was amazing and the staff was really cool too. We all liked and respected him a lot. But alas, like many good things, it came to a sudden and forceful end. An upper management decided a change was in order and shifted the supervisors opening a spot in my department. That's when the new supervisor, henceforth known as Brandy, came in. Brandy was a transfer from another store 30 minutes away. The entire supervisor team knew and were not fond of her, but she filled a void and the district manager and store manager were big fans of her for reasons unknown. We were warned that she was a woman of many faces and would tell you or promise you things you'd never get. 
I learned this about her fairly quickly, and before she even knew the staff, our strong suits, our schedules, or our names, she had a set list of things she wanted done and could not be deviated from. There were also word going around that she liked to make staffing changes and hire her own people when she came in. Morale died fairly quickly within the first week she was there. In short, she was a nightmare for almost the entire store. Now to the actual story. Brandy's first day was on a particularly busy summer day, and before I could even walk back to my section, I could hear her voice calling over the intercom constantly. Along the way, I was greeted by the morning staff, who gave me a quick rundown of her and what she was like, then told me to have fun. Oh boy, I thought to myself. I found her in the back, near the cleats, and introduced myself. You have your tasks assigned to you already, and I want all of the displays finished in your areas before you leave today. I thought this was strange because I had set up the displays for those exact sections the night prior, all according to the franchise standards. Firmly stuffed to look like a foot was in them, no visible faces shown, and even the laces changed to go inside the shoe so that they didn't instruct the view of the top of the shoe. They were signed off as completed by the lead on duty and even complimented. I was proud of my work. I went back to the sections I did the night before and looked them over for a few seconds, super confused. I shrugged it off and set to checking, or at least restuffing a few to see if I had missed something. Nope, nothing. But I continued on as I had been instructed and did my job as things seemed like they were going pretty smooth. Later on that afternoon, Brandy came back up to me and asked when I was going to finish my displays. I told her I had. She looked at me, looked back at my displays, and made a look of disgust and said, You're gonna leave them like that? Like what? I said back confused. Nothing I did ever really was a problem in the past, and I really didn't want to piss her off because I loved my job and it was my first day with her. She scoffed and said, Like this! and then grabbed a broken metal peg off a sock end cap and proceeded to jam as much paper as humanly possible into the shoe until it couldn't hold anymore. No lie, the shoe felt like someone had filled it with concrete and the fabric even protruded on some of the shoes because of the pressure. It was not pretty, nor was it guideline. After watching how she did it, I just stood there dumbstruck because, again, this went against almost all of my training up to that point. Then she started in on me. No matter how hard I tried to give her what she wanted but still met the guidelines I'd been trained for, she didn't like it and would go to me to do them again. This went on for a little bit. Then she fucked up. After an agonizing amount of time, she grabbed a shoe from me and said, No, do it perfect. If you can't do it perfect, then don't even try. Just leave it for someone else to do. Let me remind you that she had a full list of other things she wanted done, but she rang a bell I wasn't going to ignore. So instead of giving me another task, she gave me a loophole. I capitalized fully. Cue malicious compliance. After an emotional wrecking like the one she had given me, I excitedly said, okay, and walked away to help customers. I left her there with the display still in her hand. She also said this with an earshot of several other employees that were already sour with her. She doesn't want me to try if I couldn't do it perfect. Fine. That was exactly what I did. I did nothing on that list for four months. I don't even remember anything that was on there. You might be wondering, how did you not get fired? Well, she tried several times. Anytime she would try to write me up, I would quote her exact words to her, the store supervisor, the leads, the district manager, and even someone in HR when they came to visit. Eventually, she was told to stop because her attempts could be viewed as retaliation, and that was a huge corporate no-no. I still provided excellent customer service and got rave reviews and compliments when customers went to check out, and the store manager and I got along really well, so they were hesitant to push too hard. A few months later, I changed departments and then met my now wife on a store setup trip and moved across the state. When she found out I was quitting, she pretended to be upset, but everyone knew she wanted me gone. She was gone within a year of me leaving. No clue why. Totally worth it, though. Thanks for the funny memories, Brandy. And there you have it, folks. The end of the epics. If you like these stories, be sure to leave a like on them as well as subscribe with notifications turned on. That way you could stay up to date with all the latest and greatest here on the channel. As always, my name's Ryan, the official host here on Reddit Voice, uploading just about every single day. And I look forward to seeing you guys in tomorrow's video.